Hello and welcome to the recorded version of the 2021 National Weather Service Fort Worth Skywarn presentation. My name is Jason Godwin. I'm one of the meteorologists at the Fort Worth National Weather Service office and I will be leading this recorded presentation. Before we begin, note that due to copyright, you're not allowed to record this presentation. Uh, we have explicit permission from the uh, photographers in these slides to use their content for the purposes of this educational presentation. Also, we will not be providing a certificate at this time for this recorded version. So the National Weather Service in Fort Worth were located on the north side of Tarrant County. And our mission statement is to provide weather, water, and climate data, forecasts, and warnings for the protection of life and property and the enhancement of the national economy. We're responsible for 46 counties. All 46 counties, we do those forecasts and warnings. We extend from the Red River down to Fort Hood, and then from west to east, we go from kind of the Eastland, Breckenridge area over towards Paris and Palestine. Our office consists of a staff of 26 people, including meteorologists, information technology, electronics technicians, an observation program leader, administrative support, and a service hydrologist. We operate 24 hours a day, every day of the year, and we work eight to nine hour rotating shifts. In this presentation, we're going to cover some safety tips, how to identify potentially hazardous severe weather, what the criteria is for reporting severe weather, and how to report significant weather. So first and foremost is safety. All spotters should remain weather aware when hazardous weather is expected in the area. Many spotters do participate in groups such as ARIES, RACES, and other public safety groups like emergency management, fire departments, law enforcement, etc. Some may have an amateur radio operating license, and some of these groups might have formal activation procedures. However, no activation or group participation is necessary. We always appreciate reports. So the goals of a Skywarn spotter are number one, to remain safe at all times. During hazardous weather, local officials are all, already going to be busy enough dealing with the weather threats, and the last thing they need is spotters or storm chasers making even more danger. Number two is to serve on the eyes, as the eyes on the ground for the National Weather Service and the local emergency management and public safety officials. Number three is to communicate with your team and the National Weather Service. And number four is to relay relevant and thorough storm reports. For ground truth, all the National Weather Service meteorologists can see from our office in Fort Worth is what we can see through remote sensing means. Some of these might include satellite data, radar data, and surface observations. But the ground truth reports assist us in the decision support process. We receive information from spotters that are out there and we can pass that information along through communications we have as well as just through our advisories and forecast products in order to assist emergency management officials who may decide if they need to close roads, sound outdoor warning sirens, or send out their own alerts, as well as relay these reports to the, our media partners who then can communicate that information to the general public. Some definitions here is when we start off in the forecast phase, this is when severe storms are possible. Not everyone's gonna see severe weather at their specific location every time it's advertised. At that point, it's time to stay up to date with forecast updates. This time frame, we're usually talking several hours to, a, to as much as a few days or even several days in advance of possible severe weather. Then a watch gets issued a matter of hours away from when severe weather is expected. A watch means that conditions are favorable for severe weather and thunderstorms will develop soon or are already developing. At this point, it's time to pay close attention to the weather and be ready to take action if a warning is issued. Finally, you have the warning phase, which is when severe weather is occurring or is imminent at your location. That is a time that is time to take immediate action. 
And note, do you have multiple ways of getting warnings? This is very important because what if your internet goes out or what if you don't have cell phone service at the location you're at? It's always important to have multiple ways to receive severe weather warnings. Looking a little closer at a watch, a watch means there's potential for hazardous weather to occur. They tend to be issued for a large area, such as all of North Texas or all of Central Texas, and are in effect for hours at a time. These mean that conditions are favorable for hazardous weather, and some hazardous weather may already be occurring in parts of the region. At this point, continue with your daily routine, but keep advised of the weather. A warning, on the other hand, means that hazardous weather is imminent or occurring, so it is time to take action now or at the very least seek more information. A warning is issued when hazardous weather has been reported or has been indicated by radar. They are typically valid for portions of counties near the storm's path, typically for an hour or less. However, a flash flood warning may be in effect for as many as one to six hours. So our wish list for what we would like reported to our office includes tornadoes or signs that one may be developing, such as funnel clouds and strongly rotating wall clouds, and we're going to discuss what some of these look like later. Flash flooding, defined as rapidly rising water into areas that do not typically flood, or more than a foot deep, especially if the water is moving. Hail larger than three quarters of an inch in diameter and damaging winds, that is, damage caused by thunderstorm wind gusts or measured winds of more than 50 miles per hour. And to, before filing a report with us, answer these five questions. What are you reporting? Is it hail, flooding, a tornado, a wall cloud? Number two, when did it occur? Is this occurring now or earlier? And there's nothing wrong with the delayed report. Well, of course, timely is better than or a more timely current report is better than a delayed report. Delayed reports can still be helpful. Just specify when did it occur. Number three is where did it occur? Where in the city or in relation to the nearest city? Crossroads, street, intersections, or direction from the nearest town or city are what we tend to prefer. Number four, how did you make this report? Is it something you measured, such as a personal weather station measuring a wind gust up to 60 miles per hour? Are you estimating winds of 60 miles per hour? And finally, is there any damage? Describe the damage or injuries, or even better would be to send pictures. How to report stuff to our office. Our, one way is through amateur radio. Aries and Racy serve many uh, locations across North and Central Texas. Um, this is still a great way to send reports to us because we have amateur radio volunteers that are either in our office or working remotely from home that are able to forward reports to us. And we like that method of communication because we can talk to people in the field in real time, uh, we can ask follow-up questions, or they can ask us questions. Um, you can find out more information from them at wx5fwd.org. A way to send pictures to us is at the email address you see on the screen there. And then you can file reports by phone using the 1-800 number or the 817 number. The 1-800 number is the preferred method, especially after hours. Uh, a word with this 1-800 number, if you call that number, you'll receive a voicemail service. Rest assured we're receiving your report. The little voicemail box for that 1-800 number is right in our operations area. So just leave your information, uh, all your report details, and if you want a callback number, um, we'll get that information. And uh, if, we have more in, if we have more questions, we will follow up with you. But like I said, don't be deterred when you hear the voicemail. We are getting your report. Social media is also a good way to send pictures, but it may not be seen in real time. We're on Twitter at NWS Fort Worth, and we also follow the hashtags DFW Weather and CTX, or Central Texas Weather. Um, and then on Facebook at facebook.com slash NWS Dallas Fort Worth. With social media, particularly Facebook, it sometimes it's hard to see stuff in real time uh, when there's weather impacting a populated area, such as the Dallas Fort Worth area or the Killeen Waco Temple area. We'll be getting lots of reports and lots of pictures through these methods. So if you have something really urgent to say, 
stick to things like phone or amateur radio. And then finally, you have the MPing app, which is a mobile app for reporting severe weather and winter weather to us. It's a good way to file a very quick report, uh, but just note that we don't know you're necessarily a trained spotter. It ju we just get a report uh, from the MPing app. We don't know who you are or your callback information, and right now all it is is just what you're reporting. You can't really provide any additional details through that. Now, we love getting pictures, though and any additional details, because by getting pictures, it allows us to determine what's the construction material like, what is the health of the trees that are damaged, as well as being able to see the surrounding features. Let's take that picture in the lower center portion of the screen. That's a pretty big tree that's blown down there, but, uh, and so just a, a verbal report might just say a large tree was blown down. But if we look closely at this picture, we can see from the trunk of the tree that the tree may not have been very healthy. Also notice all the leaves are still in the trees and the fence in the background is completely untouched. So the winds were probably not that strong here, maybe 40 to 50 miles per hour, because we know the tree wasn't very healthy and nothing else appears to be damaged around it. Not to say this isn't a mess or a major headache for the homeowner here, but winds of over 60 miles per hour, it probably was not. Now what not to report? One is what you see on radar or satellite. Uh, obviously, we're looking at those tools from our office. Um, one of them is heavy rain and rainfall rates. We, don't we aren't too concerned with how much rain you got, uh, maybe unless it's something particularly extraordinary. Uh, we also don't really care about instantaneous rainfall rates, um, like four inches of rain an hour for 10 minutes is not very much rain at the end of the day. Um, now, of course, we do want to know if there's flash flooding. So with regards to heavy rain, really stick to if there's true flash flooding going on. And later in this presentation, we'll talk more about what kind of defines flash flooding and how to report that. A third one is scary looking clouds. That's things such as scud clouds and shelf clouds that can look rather dramatic, but are not typically harbingers of severe weather. And then finally, lightning. We have methods of detecting lightning strikes from both satellite and ground-based systems. However, we would like to know if lightning has resulted in injuries or significant damage to a structure. And then, of course, you should contact local emergency officials if lightning has started a fire. Thunderstorms come in all different types and varieties, but in general, we, we refer to them as either single-cell convection uh, or single-cell thunderstorms, which are weak, short-lived updrafts are not typically severe and tend to just have a localized threat, if anything. These are what we typically see during the summer, quick heavy downpours, maybe some wind, and sometimes quite a bit of lightning. So the lightning can certainly be a hazard, but in terms of severe weather, such as hail, tornadoes, high winds, uh, fairly uncommon with these types of storms. Then you have multi-cell clusters or lines of storm things like a squall line or a, what we call a mesoscale convective system. When severe, it's typically going to be a wind threat as the primary, maybe a secondary hail threat. There can occasionally be tornadoes embedded in those, but they're very difficult to spot. And squall line tornadoes, we actually, in fact, even on radar, they're very difficult to see. It seems like a large majority of those are something where we got a report of a damage path and the tornado was determined after the fact. Uh, these tend to be kind of in the middle of the spectrum in terms of the severe weather threat. And then on the high end, we have supercell thunderstorms, which have a very intense rotating updraft, almost always are severe, with damaging winds, large hail, and tornadoes all being possible. A severe thunderstorm by the National Weather Service standards is defined as hail of one inch, which is the size of a quarter or larger, or, or winds of 58 miles per hour or stronger. If the 58 miles per hour sounds arbitrary, that's exactly 50 knots. That's where that number comes from. A supercell is a thunderstorm with a persistent and rotating updraft. Most tornadoes do come from supercells, particularly high-end tornadoes tend to be almost always associated with supercell thunderstorms. However, only about one in five supercells produce tornadoes. Or way I like to think about it, um, most, not all supercells produce tornadoes, but almost all tornadoes come from supercells. 
the stages of thunderstorms, it always begins in what we call the cumulus phase, where you start getting the towering cumulus, um, like you see in the picture on the lower left, where you get those towers going up. Then it goes to the mature stage, like you see in the middle there, where you have the very well-defined crisp anvils on the thunderstorms. And then finally, the dissipating stage, as you see in the far right, where the last bit of precipitation falls out of the storm and you're just left with the anvil like that. During the cumulus stage, you might start seeing, as I said, these cauliflower-like structures, the towers going up, uh, usually no precipitation yet. Uh, this is the early stage of thunderstorm development. When you get to the mature stage of the thunderstorm, you start getting that well-defined anvil, a strong overshooting top, the very crisp cumulonimbus clouds around it. And so what we look for is you have a very strong updraft at this point. The updraft is where the warm air is rising into the storm and is typically going to be noted by a rain-free base. There's, in the updraft portion of the storm, you're typically going to have no precipitation. And then where the precipitation is all falling down is where in the cool air is exiting the storm is the downdraft portion of the storm. Here's a, a picture of a real world example. The updraft is over on the left. You have the wall cloud and the rain free base. No precipitation is falling out of the storm because the air is rising and actually preventing any droplets from falling out of the storm. And then off to the right and kind of in the background, you see the precipitation, rain and hail falling. That's the downdraft portion of the storm. So a supercell structure can be defined as having a crisp and cauliflower texture, it tends to be rounded in the mid-levels, which are indicative of that rotating updraft. The rain-free base will be underneath it, with strong winds blowing into the updraft portion of the storm. Some features you can look for are an overshooting top, which is the cloud material you see actually on top of the anvil. How those form is the anvil on a storm it first forms when the updraft of the storm hits the stratosphere and the clouds kind of spread out beneath the stratosphere. But if the updraft is strong enough, the momentum can actually carry the updraft into the stratosphere, resulting in that overshooting top. You can look for the stacked plate look or striations, like you see in the picture in the lower right, that gives away the rotation in the storm. And then you can look for a wall cloud which we'll discuss more in depth later, as well as funnel clouds and tornadoes. So here's that overshooting top again. Again, it's that crisp and cauliflower-like texture. And this is where the momentum of the updraft is actually carrying the cloud material above the anvil and actually into the lower portions of the stratosphere. In the mid-levels, you can look for those rounded striated clouds, sometimes referred to as a stacked plate. Uh, the, it is the rotation in the mid-levels of a thunderstorm called the mesocyclone that actually gives rise to this look. And then in the low levels, you can look for the rain-free base, where you have winds blowing into the storm and rising up into the updraft. That's where that rain-free base is. And again, that, that is caused by the updraft actually preventing precipitation from falling out of the storm in that portion. And notice in the picture on the right, you can actually see the grass blowing into the storm there. And you can see the funnel cloud in the updraft portion. Wall clouds are sometimes found during the updraft portion of a supercell and are noted as being a very prominent, pronounced lowering of the cloud material underneath that updraft. A funnel cloud, as the name would suggest, is a funnel-shaped cloud that tends to be found in the updraft portion of the storm underneath the wall cloud most of the time. They're not in contact with the ground yet, but this is the area to watch for any potential tornado development. And then you have the tornado, which is when the circulation comes in contact with the ground and the thunderstorm. And the picture we see here, it doesn't look like the funnel is all the way to the ground, but you can see the debris and dust being lofted up by the, the rotating column of air. That's how we know this is a tornado and not just a funnel cloud. So note that 
the funnel does not have to be all the way to the ground. It's just simply the column of air that is rotating is in contact with both the ground and the parent thunderstorm. Here's some more pictures from of tornadoes. One, the one on the left is one taken at night where the tornado was illuminated by a lightning strike. And then on the right, there's another picture again where you can see the funnel isn't quite all the way to the ground, but you can see dust and debris getting kicked up underneath that funnel. Here's a short video of tornadic development. You see the, the rotating wall cloud and it's very strong rotation. The type of rotation we talk about with respect to is there a rotating wall cloud is very pronounced, very strong, not something you're gonna have to really second guess. And then at the end of the short video clip there, you can actually see the formation of the tornado. And I'll note once again, notice that this is in the rain-free base of the storm. There's no precipitation falling here. This is in the updraft portion of the thunderstorm. Here's another tornado video from southern Kansas where you can just see how strong the inflow is into the tornado with that inflow and updraft winds being strong enough that it actually lifts this structure off of the ground. Another tornado video here. Again, notice the strong circulation of the wall cloud, which is above the funnel cloud. And the funnel cloud is again reaching down from below the wall cloud. And all of this is occurring in the updraft or rain-free portion of the thunderstorm. So that's something that's important to keep in mind is most of the stuff, if we're gonna be looking at a supercell thunderstorm, with the potential for tornadic development, the updraft portion of the thunderstorm is where to focus your attention. However, not all supercells are like this. In this particular case, the tornado is actually occurring back behind a rain curtain here. Uh, it's a little grainy in this video, but this is what's referred to as a high precipitation supercell where sometimes the rain can wrap back into the updraft of the storm and make the tornado somewhat difficult to see. But then there's one of the imposters we like to talk about, and this is the scud cloud. Scud cloud is, are small and detached cloud fragments and they can give the appearance of a funnel cloud or a wall cloud sometimes. Uh, some of them can actually look rather convincing, like the one on the right is a good example. However, some giveaways are they tend to not be organized and not have any sustained rotation. So if you're unsure, just watch it for a few minutes. If it's, if it's a true wall cloud, it's going to exhibit very strong rotation and maintain that organization. Certainly if we're dealing with the kind of supercell and wall cloud that's going to be associated with a tornado. However, the scud can sometimes be part of the wall cloud development. You can have scud cloud associated with a supercell that can kind of get pulled into the updraft of the storm. Looking at the downdraft portion of the supercell, this is tends to be visually identified as a dark and murky area with outflow winds. This is where all the rain and hail is falling. Some features you can look for to identify the downdraft are a shelf cloud on the leading edge. A shelf cloud is the picture in the lower left there. And it tends to have this choppy look underneath it. Shelf clouds and the downdraft portion of the storm can be associated with hail and strong straight line winds, but not always, uh, and as well as heavy rain. Now, one way you can identify the difference between a shelf cloud and a wall cloud is in the notice in the diagram in the upper right, as well as if you think back to a few of the pictures of wall clouds I showed earlier, the wall cloud tends to be a very localized and prominent lowering. 
On the other hand, a shelf cloud, like you see in the picture in the lower left, or in the schematic in the upper right, the shelf cloud tends to go from horizon to horizon. It's not just a localized lowering. It tends to be just, like I said, it'll go from horizon to horizon, be several miles long like that, versus a wall cloud that is, you know, just a matter of, you know, maybe a mile or so in diameter. It tends to be a much more localized feature. So uh, some more characteristics of downdrafts, they can have this choppy and turbulent look versus you might remember showing the in the updraft pictures earlier where it had that kind of smooth striated appearance. You might also have rain shafts such as the one there in the right hand picture. Again, you can look for those dark and murky areas and then the time lapse on the right shows you a shelf cloud with that very turbulent appearance. So this is the leading edge of a thunderstorm here. There's the shelf cloud. Uh, we're looking, like I said, on kind of the, the forward side of a supercell. There's, and you can notice the turbulent look to it, that the shelf cloud goes from nearly horizon to horizon, and most importantly, you have the precipitation that you can see falling directly underneath it. Shifting gears a little bit, we're going to talk about hail. When it comes to reporting hail, uh, obviously the, the most important thing, or one of the most important things, is reporting how big is the hail. Uh, the best way, the, the absolute best way to report hail is, like you see in the pictures on the left there, using a ruler, a tape measure, and my personal favorite is that lower left-hand picture, using the digital calipers, and they were actually giving us the measurements in millimeters. Well, we appreciate that level of accuracy, uh, inches is just fine. And if you don't have a ruler or tape measure or digital calipers handy, you can always just relate it to an object of known size. Uh, with that, tend to you should stick to things that have a fairly standard size, like currency, you know, pennies, nickels, quarters, a ping pong ball, a baseball, a softball. Uh, while I do realize that not all grapefruits are exactly four inches in diameter, if someone says a grapefruit size hail, I know it is very large at that point, you know, three and a half, four, four inches in diameter then. So again, stick to objects of known size. What aren't as helpful are pictures of it just in your hand, um, because I don't know if this is a six foot seven person holding it, or if this is a child holding it. Um, what also not very helpful is saying marble size hail because marbles come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, but what is helpful is again, what you see in the, on the right hand side, if you don't necessarily have a ruler or tape measure handy next to objects of known size, next to a ping pong ball or next to a $1 bill because I can quickly look up how big, what are the dimensions of a $1 bill like that or what is the size of a ping pong ball. Those are objects of known size. Now, one question we get a lot is if you have hail that is kind of different sizes. There's big hail, small hail, uh, kind of chipped hail in this picture. Would you? So people ask, do I report the average, the largest, kind of the majority or most common? And what we want to know is the largest size hail you see. So if it's mostly dimes, but there's a few quarters in there, we want to know about the quarter size hail. And then you have situations such as in this picture where you have kind of oblong or spiky hailstones. And so people like to ask us, do you want the shortest, the longest, the average? And we want the longest dimension. So you would actually report this as a two and a half inch diameter hailstone. So some great examples of good hail reports would look something like these. I'm a train spotter and I would like to report hail approximately two and a half inches in Plano near Highway 75 in the George Bush Turnpike. The hail fell from 3.15 to 3.25 p.m., damaging my carport and knocking down small tree branches. So that's kind of the formula. I would like to report hail of a certain size, 
that fell at this time at this location. Again, include the time, the location, the size of the hail. Are you estimating the size? Did you measure the size? And if there's any damage with that hail. Not so good reports are ones that are either vague or those that are estimated by questionable means, such as large hail fell in Dallas last night. It's hailing here now. Um, and this is an actual report we got one time. The hail is bouncing on the ground, so it must be at least however many inches in size. Uh, these are all very vague or questionable ways of reporting hail. Like take, let's take the top example here, large hail in Dallas last night. Dallas covers many square miles, um, so that doesn't really exactly tell me where in Dallas it was. What time was it last night? How big was the large hail? So again, be specific with what, how you're reporting. And then for safety reasons, and I can't believe I have to say this, but please wait until hail is done falling before attempting to assess the size. Looking at straight line winds, there's a few main sources that we can get for these damaging straight line winds. You can have the downdraft region of a supercell or during the dissipation stage. So as the storm is dissipating and the last bit of precipitation is falling out, what will happen is that the rain will be evaporating as the drier air moves in. And as that evaporation occurs, the air cools and the cold air goes rushing to the ground where it strikes the ground and spreads out. You can see that in a picture on the, on the left hand side where you see the precipitation falling and then you can see a large um, kind of wave or foot of dust being kicked up as the, as the cold downdraft air is spreading out along the ground. Another source of straight line winds is squall lines. And other damaging weather can exist with squall lines. They can have hail and, as I mentioned earlier, even tornadoes. But damaging wind gusts tend to be the, the biggest threat with straight line winds, or rather with squall lines. Estimating wind speeds can be tricky, however. We do have, you can use the table on the left to kind of get an idea, but honestly, the best thing to do is to just send pictures or just a description of the damage. Um, even amongst meteorologists, there can be a lot of debate when we see a picture of how strong the winds were. We have to, but which is why we just like getting pictures, is we can assess, you know, what the surroundings are, the construction type, how healthy were, or big were the trees that were blown down. Um, and straight line winds, it's important to note, can be just as damaging as tornadoes. In fact, just last night from when I was recording this uh, presentation, there was a straight line wind event that went through Nebraska that produced wind gusts of over 90 miles per hour in the city of Omaha. So again, pictures can be a lot more helpful when it comes to reporting damaging or straight line winds. It doesn't take a whole lot to blow over small trees and fences. Um, and then once you start getting up around 60 to 70 miles per hour, you might start seeing uh, sheds or barns have the roofs peeled back, uh, medium-sized trees blown over. And then once you get over 90 to 100 miles per hour, you start looking at major damage to even well-constructed structures. So great examples of wind damage reports would include something like these. I am a train spotter and would like to report damage to my house from last night's storms. Several large trees, about 15 inches in diameter, have been uprooted in our neighborhood. Fences are also knocked down. I'm located in Fort Worth near Beach Street and Loop 820. The damage happened about 9.15 p.m. last night. I've emailed some pictures to you. So again, they're including the time, the location of the damage, a description of it, and they even sent us a picture. Some vague reports, though, might say a tree branch fell down in my yard, there's wind damage in our area, or it got really windy and loud here. Again, these are just vague reports that don't really tell us much about how strong the winds really were. And this is a common one we'll get, is I think the winds were at least 60 miles per hour, but nothing is damaged. If you have over 60 mile per hour winds, almost certainly something is going to be damaged. You're, you're approaching hurricane force winds at that point. And ask someone, and I'm originally from Louisiana, that's been even through a category one hurricane, which is wind starting at 75 miles per hour, and that will produce major damage at that point. 
So if you have 60 mile per hour winds, there should be at least some damage. So then you have flooding. We tend to break this into kind of two types of flooding. You have just river flooding or main stem river flooding, which is like when the Trinity River gets high or something like that. And at that point, we're talking about an overflow of water onto what is normally dry land, usually standing or slow moving water, often occurring near existing waterways. Um, you have minor or common flooding, which is the type of flooding that it just might be ankle deep or occurring in a low lying area that frequently floods. Um, it, and it can last longer, can go on for days, weeks, or even months if we've had a lot of rain. Flash flooding, on the other hand, is a rapid rise of swift moving water that results in a threat to life or property. This can occur within minutes or hours of excessive rainfall and it occurs for short periods of time, usually six hours or less. And this is the kind of flooding that does not occur very often unless we've been just in a very wet period like May of 2015. So again, the common and minor flooding, you have the picture on the left where you have a river or lake that is out of its banks and flooding the adjacent land, or the picture on the right where you have a low water crossing that has been inundated. These do not constitute flash flooding because they are either right next to an existing waterway or just an already low lying flood prone area. Flash flooding on the other hand, looks something like this, where you have water beginning to get into structures or roads becoming impassable. I mean, the picture on the right, you see the, the water is up, you know, well past the doors of that car. An example of a video of flash flooding, while this does appear to be some kind of low water crossing or creek bed, just notice how fast that water is moving. And by the way, don't do this. Um, as you can see here, it only took, the water wasn't that deep where the car was. It was only, you know, what, a foot or so up, but that moving water exerts a tremendous amount of force and it does not take much moving water to wash a car away. Even, even a large vehicle like a truck or an SUV, it does not take much moving water to wash it off the road. So a good report of flash flooding might look something like this. I'm a train spotter and would like to report flash flooding on Joe Ramsey Boulevard on the east side of Greenville. I'm estimating about three feet of water moving over the roadway. The water started rising at 8.20 p.m. and it's still rising at the current time. I've lived here for 20 years and I've never seen anything like this. I emailed you all a picture. Not so good reports are ones that are just vague or speculative like water is covering the road, the streets are inundated with water or we need an arc out here, or it's raining hard. What we, the kind of information we need on a flash flooding report, on that good report, that last, second to last sentence is very important, where he says, I've lived here 20 years, I've never seen anything like this. One question I will often ask if someone calls and reports flooding, is I'll ask them, have you seen this location flood before? And if they say, no, I've never seen this flood, I've lived here 20 years, this is not just one of those usual spots in town that floods every time it rains, I'm going to take that a lot more seriously than it's flooding, but this is kind of like an underpass or under a railroad crossing. And yeah, anytime we get just kind of a decent rainfall, this goes underwater. So again, the time, the location, magnitude, we also want to know the behavior of the flood water. Is it standing water or is it moving water? Uh, what's the frequency of the flooding here? And then again, pictures and videos are great for flash flooding. So to go through some safety tips here, because as we said at the beginning of the talk, safety is the number one priority. Don't underestimate the threat. While you know this is an, an important public service to report these, and the, these storms can be very dramatic and quite photogenic, you have all kinds of threats, obvi the obvious ones like the tornadoes and the lightning uh, and flooding, but even threats we don't immediately think about, like the traffic if you're out mobile spotting. Unfortunately, storm chasers have been seriously injured or even killed uh, in car accidents out there. So uh, don't underestimate the threats and hazards. Stay away from windows. Be inside of a strong building. 
And mobile homes and temporary buildings and vehicles can sometimes be better than nothing and protect you from wind and small hail, but you really want to be inside a stronger structure if you can. At night, it's even more dangerous because you have less visibility. Lightning and power flashes can backlight storm structures like the pictures you see there on the right. Uh, the upper right, you can see a wall cloud being illuminated by a lightning strike. And then the lower picture, you can actually see a tornado that was illuminated by a lightning strike. And at that point, it's good to work in teams. Be extra vigilant about communication. Um, and that can give you a better idea where the storms are. Keep in mind those models uh, of what a supercell thunderstorm looks like, the updraft, the downdraft area. And if you do one of our advanced Skywarn talks sometime, they'll actually show you kind of more schematics of what a supercell thunderstorm looks like. And you can keep that conceptual model in mind for, uh, especially at night, when it's hard to actually see the, the, the features as well. For flash flood safety, we like to say turn around, don't drown. Never drive around barricades or emergency vehicles as it only takes a couple feet of water to move most vehicles. And six to 12 inches of water can knock a person off their balance. So stay away from creeks and ditches. And especially at night, flash flooding can be even more dangerous. Almost all flash flooding fatalities in the United States occur in vehicles. For hail, avoid core punching, which is where you drive through that downdraft, that you know murky precipitation area to get to the updraft on the other side of the storm, because that's where you're going to encounter very large hail. Um, you want to stay inside a vehicle or building. Again, don't measure hail while it's still falling. And an important one is do not shelter under overpasses. Uh, we've gotten pictures. I don't mean to pick on you, Bell County, but I remember one in particular is Walk is getting lots of pictures of people stopping on Interstate 35 in Temple during a hailstorm, which is very dangerous because the, the traffic coming up on you is not expecting to see people stop. You can impede emergency vehicles. So if, you if you're on a freeway or interstate and you encounter a hailstorm, just get off at the next exit. Do not stop under overpasses or on the side of the road as it can be very dangerous to do so on an interstate highway. For lightning, move inside when you hear the first thunder. Strong grounded buildings are the best and, or vehicles with the windows rolled up, specifically hardtop vehicles. Uh, but don't touch anything connected to the outside of your vehicle, such as your ham radio mic that's connected to the antenna on the roof of your car. And you want to stay in shelter until 30 minutes after the last thunder because lightning can actually strike as many as five or six miles away from where any precipitation is falling. For tornado safety, the best place to be is underground. Though I do realize here in North Texas and in Central Texas, basements are somewhat rare. So what we like to say is put as many walls as possible between you and the tornado, uh, or you and the outside. Avoid large open rooms, stay away from windows, and be in a small interior room of the lowest floor. Closets, bathrooms, hallways are the best. Vehicles are better than nothing, but if time allows, get outside. If you're caught out in the open, use a ditch or a culvert as a last resort. And much like for hail, overpasses are also a bad shelter idea for tornadoes because the overpass can actually act as a wind tunnel and you know sweep you away or blow lots of very fast moving debris underneath there. For damaging winds, if you're driving, pull off the road and at the very least, slow down. Be aware of sudden changes in visibility, um, especially if you're like out west. You've probably seen the videos from Arizona or New Mexico where you'll have these thunderstorm downdraft winds that will kick up the huge dust storm. So be aware of any sudden changes in vis visibility or just blinding rain in the wind. You'll want to watch for power flashes, which is you get these bright flashes when transformers are destroyed in high winds. Look for down trees and other damage. If you're at home or in a building, keep away from windows and stay in an interior room. So some ways you can get hazardous weather information. Uh, not every method is perfect or fail safe, which is why we recommend having multiple ways to receive your warnings. NOAA weather radio is still a great way to receive alerts. Local television and radio stations, wireless emergency alerts and weather apps on smartphones and tablets, uh, internet sites, and from your friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors. 
Uh, a word on the outdoor sirens. Outdoor sirens are a way, those are designed to alert people who are outside to basically say, go inside and find out more information. The outdoor warning system should not be your primary way of receiving warnings, especially if you're indoors. So use these other methods as ways to receive warnings first. Some additional resources, if you go to our website, weather.gov forward slash FWD forward slash Skywarn, you can see some of the um, other information that's out there. There's recordings from our 2019 and 2020 Skywarn talks. We have, you can also do a search for Comet Skywarn for a basic nationally developed online Skywarn class. As far as our next round of in-person classes, um, I'm not sure when those will be, likely sometime in spring of 2022. So just uh, check back on our website and social media channels uh, either late this year or early next year. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do those in person again. And so with that, I'll say thank you for watching this recorded talk. There's my contact information you, of how you can get in contact with us or me if you have any questions about anything you saw here. And finally, I'll close by saying if you have any photos or videos that are yours that we can use in future Skyward Talks, you can email them to the email address you see there. Thank you for watching.